And then in the same book, turn to number 139, Far, Far Away from My Loving Father. Uh, one of our scriptures this morning is the story of the prodigal son. And this hymn tells that story. Uh, we will be singing, we will not sing the refrain in between each verse. We will sing it, we'll start with the refrain. Um, actually, no, we'll sing it just straight through the way that it's written. Verse 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then the refrain at the end, like verse 6. One last gathering song, turn to number 23, um, sorry, 25, Jesus Stand Among Us, 2-5. Prepare your hearts for worship, um, listening to the prelude by Gogo Liagisi.
May the great and steadfast love of God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer be with us all. My name is Kevin Miller, <clears throat> and I welcome you to this time of worship with our congregation gathered here in this space and also via the technologies of radio, television, and the internet. As we begin our worship this morning, I invite you to just take a moment to look around you, greeting those who are near you with a smile or a touch or a word. Those of you participating at a distance, welcome the friends and family who are with you or whisper a prayer for those close to you. It's wonderful <clears throat> to experience community together through our faces smiling, our hands touching, and our greetings. This is our first Sunday of our Anabaptist Learning Month. The overarching worship theme is reconciliation is the center of our work. Pastor and author Palmer Becker says that this is a distinctive characteristic of Christianity lived from an Anabaptist perspective. Over the next four Sundays, we will sing, listen, pray, confess, and testify to the gifts and challenges of reconciliation as a way of life. Reconciliation starts in God's great care and love in the creation for all the people of the world and every person created in God's image. Being mindful of this great love, we worship God today, who through Jesus and the Holy Spirit has brought us ever deeper into God's unending love mercy, and grace. I invite you now to join me in our call to worship as printed in your bulletin. Hear, O oh people, escucha, O oh pueblo, our powerful, holy, merciful, and sovereign God is one. Nuestro poderoso, santo, misericordioso, y soberano Dios, Es uno. And we will love our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbors as ourselves. Y amaremos a nuestro Dios con todo nuestro corazón, alma, mente y fuerza, y nuestras vecinos como nosotros mismos. Do this and you will live. Haz esto y vivirás. Please open your purple Sing the Story books and open your eyes to number 65, Abre Mis Ojos. The text for both of these next two songs will be projected as well as found in your books. I feel like the presentation on the page is just a little confusing. Uh, we will be singing verses 1 through 3 in Spanish, then verse 4 in English, and then we'll repeat verse 3 in English one more time.
and turn back just a few pages to number 62, Create in Me a Clean Heart. Uh, we will be singing verses 1, 3, and 4, skipping verse 2. Um, please stand in, in body if you are able, or if body feels a little challenging today, please stand in spirit with us. As we enter into our time of prayer this morning, we will join together to repeat the prayer response that is printed in the bulletin. God so loved the world, Dios amas tanto este mundo. We will repeat this phrase each time I say, we pray together. And our prayer time will close with the prayer of confession that will be projected on the screen. And we have both English and Spanish available, and I invite you to pray in whichever language you are most comfortable, or in whichever language you want to 
expand your linguistic skills. Let us pray. Gracious and generous God, lover of this planet and all its people, thank you for creating a home in which we can live, move, and have our being. We pray together, God so loved the world, Dios amas tanto este mundo. Thank you for your spirit that breathes in each of us and holds us in your care from the moment of our birth until we breathe our last. We pray together, God so loved the world, Dios amas tanto este mundo. Thank you for giving us companions with whom we share our lives, plants and creatures, family and friends, neighbors and strangers, and even enemies. We pray together, God so loved the world, Dios amas tanto este mundo. Thank you for giving us Jesus, who shows us your face who brings us home to you and draws us more deeply into your unimaginable mercy, justice, and grace. We pray together. God so loved the world. Dios amas tanto este mundo. We pray for members of our congregation and the world. For Brent Blau, as he anticipates surgery this week at St. Luke's Hospital in Fort Wayne for the placement of a pacemaker defibrillator. We pray that this will provide a path for healing and renewed strength for his heart that has suffered many cardiac events in recent months. For Tina, Adam, Dakota, and Briggs Hartman, and their extended family as they grieve the loss of Tina's father, Nathan Carter, who died last Sunday. For Sylvia Jackson, experiencing discomfort in the healing process following surgery, we pray your healing and comforting presence as she returns to the Columbus Hospital on August 12. For those who are hurt and are suffering by injustice, by hateful words and actions that fail to recognize your face in the face of the other, give us courage to speak your love, your desire for reconciliation and understanding into these troubled times. Challenge us to extend your love to those who are living out of narrow perspectives and fear of others, that we might invite them into a broader space of welcome and acceptance. We pray together, God, you so love the world. Dios amas tanto este mundo. God, you call us to a ministry of reconciliation and send us as your ambassadors into the world, and yet we are not prepared to do this work. And so, in confession, we pray in both English and Spanish. We confess that we get in the way of your reconciling work in our world. Our words are often spoken with disrespect and violence. We want others to yield to our viewpoints. We hang on to our grudges. Our actions often hurt the people and creatures that you love. We fail to see your image in the people with whom we disagree. Our patience falters when the work of restoring relationships gets hard. God, we pray for the Spirit of Jesus to work among us as we learn together over these weeks. Open our minds, hearts, and spirits that we may grow in maturity and humility. Prepare us to take up the work of reconciliation 
for the sake of this world that you so love. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. This morning, we begin collecting coins for the My Coins Count project, sponsored by MCC Great Lakes. As we sing, Love the Lord Your God, please bring your coins to the containers up front, or send them along with one of the children as they make their way to the circle for children's time. Sing the story number 55. Good morning, everyone. I have a story to tell you this morning, and I brought some very special, special sheep to help me tell the story. The story is called Five Little Sheep, and we have these cute little sheep at home that I brought to help me tell the story. Um, boys, did you take one of my sheep? No. Ava, did you have one of my sheep? Oh, this is embarrassing. I had all of them when we were sitting in the balcony. I wonder if I dropped it. Uh, I, I don't know where the sheep is. Tell the story with four. I'll go check. Okay. Uh, I had just checked. We just had them all in the hallway. Um, Seth's going to go look for me. I'm going to start telling the story. I bet I dropped it right out here. But I have a story called Five Little Sheep, and it goes like this. Five little sheep all in a row. The first one says, I love you so. The second one says, will you be my valentine? The third one says, I will if you'll be mine. The fourth one says, I'll always be your friend. The fifth one, the fifth one, it's not here. Seth, I, I thought I could tell this story, but I don't, I don't have all of my sheep, and I need all the sheep to tell the story. I just had it. Does anybody see my sheep? 
Can you help me look? I, I don't know that I can use a pig. I think I need a sheep. Can you help me look? I, I just had it. We just checked before we came down. I just had the sheep. Can you help me look? Move the, move the boxes around. Look and see. Where's my sheep? It looks like this. It's just a little, it's just a little sheep. Can you help me find it? Don't just sit there. Can you help me find the sheep? <laughs> look around your bags. Look and see if it crawled underneath the pews. I just, I just had the sheep. We need to find the sheep so I can tell you the story. Please don't just sit there. I can't find the sheep. Can you look around? Well, it's got to be here somewhere. Has anybody found the sheep? Keep looking. I don't know where it is. Help me look. Well, there's four of them. Where? Are you looking, people? We found the sheep! We found the sheep! Oh, thank you. We have all five sheep. I was so worried, and we found them. So now we've got all five sheep. Can I finish the story for you? You want to hear the story. Five little sheep all in a row. The first one says, I love you so. The second one says, will you be my valentine? The third one says, I will if you'll be mine. The fourth one says, I'll always be your friend. The fifth one says, we'll all be friends until the end. Oh, I am so relieved we found the sheep. You know, Jesus tells a story about some sheep that was kind of like this. He tells a story about a shepherd that has a whole bunch of sheep, and one of those sheep ran away and was lost. And the shepherd couldn't rest, couldn't relax until he found that missing sheep. And do you know why, why Jesus tells us this story? Because God is a lot like that shepherd. God's love for us is so big that when one of us is lost, when one of us has lost our way, Jesus says that God looks for us and searches for us and longs to bring us back. Isn't that amazing? The God that created the heavens and the earth, the God that created the mountains and the seas, the God that created all of the plants and the animals, the God that created all of us and all of the billions of people in the world loves each of us so much that when one of us is lost, God searches for us and so desperately wants to bring us back. Yes. It's amazing. Let's say a prayer and then you can get your worship back. Dear God, we thank you so much that your love for us is so big and so huge, that you have so much mercy and forgiveness with us. When you may get your worship bags, and if you wanted to see one of my sheep on the way out, you can come do that. You can pet one of my sheep. While the children are petting the sheep, let's turn to number 170 in the blue hymnal worship book, The King of Love My Shepherd Is, 170. Um, we'll sing all the verses. On verse 3, I would like the women to sing, and on verse 4, we'll have the men sing.
following the reading of our scripture passage this morning, uh, the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15, there will be a period for silent reflection on what you have heard. If you need help with your reflection, you will find questions in the, printed in the bulletin and also projected on the screens uh, to help you. I've asked uh, Gabe to come up and my son, Gabe, my prodigal son, Gabe, <laughs> no, uh, to, to read the story in Spanish and the English translation will be up on the screens. Lucas 15, 11 a 32. Un hombre tenía dos hijos, continuó Jesús. El menor de ellos le dijo a su padre, Papá, dame lo que me toca de la herencia. Así que el padre repartió sus bienes entre los dos. Poco después, el hijo menor juntó todo lo que tenía y se fue a un país lejano. Ahí vivió desenfrenadamente y derrochó su herencia. Cuando ya lo había gastado todo, sobrevino una gran escasez en la región y él comenzó a pasar necesidad. Así que fue y consiguió empleo con un ciudadano de aquel país, quien lo mandó a sus campos a cuidar cerdos. Tanta hambre tenía que hubiera querido llenarse el estómago con la comida que daban a los cerdos, pero aún así nadie le daba nada. Por fin recapacitó y se dijo, ¿Cuántos jornaleros de mi padre tienen comida de sobra y yo aquí me muero de hambre? Tengo que volver a mi padre y decirle, Papá, he pecado contra el cielo y contra ti. Ya no merezco que se me llame tu hijo. Trátame como si fuera uno de tus jornaleros. Así que emprendió el viaje y se fue a su padre. Todavía estaba lejos cuando su padre lo vio y se compadeció de él. Salió corriendo a su encuentro, lo abrazó y lo besó. El joven le dijo, «Papá, he pecado contra el cielo y contra ti. Ya no merezco que se me llame tu hijo». Pero el padre ordenó a sus siervos, «Pronto, tráiganle mejor ropa para vestirlo. Pónganle también un anillo en el dedo y sandalías en los pies». Traigan el ternero más gordo y mátenlo para celebrar un banquete. Porque este hijo mío estaba muerto, pero ahora ha vuelto a la vida. Se había perdido, pero ya lo hemos encontrado. Así que empezaron a hacer fiesta. Mientras tanto, el hijo mayor estaba en el campo. Al volver, cuando se acercó a la casa, halló, oyó la música del baile. Entonces llamó a uno de los siervos y le preguntó qué pasaba. «Ha llegado tu hermano», le respondió, «y tu papá ha matado el ternero más gordo porque ha recobrado a su hijo sano y salvo». Indignado, el hermano mayor se negó a entrar. Así que su padre salió a suplicarle lo que hiciera. Pero él le contestó, Fíjate cuántos años te he servido sin desobedecer jamás tus órdenes, y ni un cabrito me has dado para celebrar una fiesta con mis amigos. Pero ahora llega ese hijo tuyo que ha despilfarrado tu fortuna con prostitutas y tú mandas matar en su honor el tenero más gordo. Hijo mío, le dijo su padre, tú siempre estás conmigo y todo lo que tengo es tuyo. Pero teníamos que hacer fiesta y alegrarnos, porque este hermano tuyo estaba muerto, pero ahora ha vuelto a la vida. Se había perdido, pero ya lo hemos encontrado.
Our preacher this morning <clears throat> is Don Blosser. Carolyn and Don have been members of College Mennonite Church for about 40 years now, so he is well known to many of you. Don is a retired professor of Bible from Goshen College, uh, an active member of Michiana Voices for Middle East Peace, and also active in many local projects in our community and in the region. Please pray with me. Loving and reconciling God, breathe your spirit into our hearts and into Don's words as we listen to the message you have given him to share with us this morning. Amen. Thank you, Kevin. I want to begin this morning with a story. It's a true story, and I have Miriam's permission to share it with you. In 1976, our family moved to Scotland. Now, Scottish schools start in the middle of August. We arrived in the middle of September. We enrolled our children in school, and I thought everything was going quite well. That is, until the third day. Miriam got up in the morning in tears. She was five and in first grade. Daddy, I don't want to go to school. Don't make me go to school. I'll stay here at home and you can teach me and I'll study real hard, Daddy. Don't make me go. Miriam, you have to go to school. All the children go to school. This went on for several days. Finally, one evening after supper, I asked Miriam, Miriam, could you and Daddy take a walk? Just you and me. And so we went down by the North Sea on the shore and took a short walk. And I asked Miriam, Miriam, back home you loved going to school. Now here it seems like there's something wrong. Can you tell me what, what's wrong or what are you afraid of? Miriam stopped walking and said, Daddy, uh, my, my teacher is, is a big, tall man, and he wears a black robe, and, and, and he has a yardstick. And, and if you break a rule, he hits you with his yardstick. And I don't want him to hit me. And Daddy, I try to be good. I really do. But nobody told me the rules. The next morning, I went to school with Miriam, met with the principal, and we agreed together that because Miriam could read and knew her numbers, that she would probably fit better in the one and a half class rather than first grade, second grade. And they immediately transferred her into this one and a half first grade class. That afternoon, Miriam didn't come home from school. And I was worried. And I literally ran the three blocks to school to find Miriam. And I found her with her new teacher and another little one and a half grade little girl. They were helping their teacher, a middle-aged woman, clean the blackboards, tidy up the room. Now I wonder, this morning, <clears throat> our subject is being reconciled to God. But my first question for us is, what kind of God are we asking you to be reconciled with? What's your image of God? I started out with a God image of a grandfather who was loving but very strict and couldn't wait to punish you if you misbehaved. With that judgmental image of God, I grew up as a boy into high school and college. I was way beyond first grade when I discovered there were other ways to think about God. Maybe we could think about God as Miriam's teacher, a middle-aged woman who greeted you by name and gave you a hug when you walked in the door, who sat down on the floor on the story rug with the children to read a story. That's the image of God 
I'd like you to have this morning with me. Because in my reading of the Jesus stuff, that's the image that Jesus has in his mind as he talks about this loving Father. That's the image of Jesus in a world that was full of tall men in dark robes with yardsticks. Let me paraphrase Paul, Galatians 2. We all know that a person does not win their justification with God by being good, but by trusting in what Jesus taught. God does not love us because we're so good at keeping the rules, because keeping the rules is not what God is all about. God wants us to accept the reality that we are loved deeply, carefully, and he wants us to be free to live with hope and peace and joy so that those around us might also live with peace and hope and joy. I'm going to suggest this morning that being reconciled to God is not our job. Scripture tells us that God has already reconciled us unto God's own self. Again, Paul. All this comes from God who has settled the relationship between us and God and has now called us to settle the relationships with each other. Our task is to stop fighting among ourselves and accept that which God so desperately wants for us and for everyone who shares the world with us. Belief in this reconciling God that Jesus talks about is, in my judgment, a faith statement. 1 John 4. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and God's love is made perfect in us. Now, that suggests to me that all language about God is faith language, a commitment to live with the awareness that the factual data about God is way beyond my pay scale. It's inevitable if that is true, if inevitable as God reaches out with us trying to make God's own self known, that if there are three of us who have differing views about how we think and talk about God, does that really mean the two of us have to be wrong? Could it be that the creativity of this reconciling, loving God is vast enough that God can handle two or three, or maybe two or three thousand, different ways to identify, talk about, and experience God? Might it be that our human frailty is just quite incapable of mastering the total, full, exhaustive concept of this divine entity that we call God. Maybe God really is bigger than we think God might be. Some of us, myself included, are not comfortable with the highly personalized, manipulatory God that we learned about as children. So I'd like to suggest this morning, if it is difficult for you to fit God into your frame of reference and thinking, maybe we should stop being so theological and become a bit more human and practical. Because, it, it, we all know this, it is in Jesus, that human, that God became known to us. And maybe if we could become human again and think about this God who cares about us, we might be able to discover where God dwells in the midst of us. If we could look for expressions of love in the people and the events of the day in which we live, it might help us because Jesus said, that's where God dwells. That's where God dwells. I suggest that being reconciled to God 
does not require that you first have a doctrinally full, complete understanding or definition of God. Maybe we can follow God with our frailty and our humanness and our lack of being able to really grab a hold of God and hang on. So, how can we be reconciled to God and experience that reconciling love that God would endeavor each of us to have? A couple exceedingly simple suggestions. Number one, let's intentionally look for expressions of beauty all around us because the psalmist tells us that it's in that beauty of nature that God has experienced, that beauty is the handiwork of God. Two, let's consciously start our day with a very simple prayer. Lord, walk with me today that I might be sensitive to those who are walking alongside me. Three, let's pray that we might be a community of faith that dares to listen to each other and who willingly listens to the stranger among us so that the next time we see them, they're not strangers because we've listened to each other. Dare we say that God is better experienced within us as a community than within, than within me as a person? God dwells in the midst of us, in all of us as we share together in thinking, working, praying, living, and simply being who we are. Thus, perhaps a crucial question would be, how does God's Holy Spirit give life to the reconciliation that we have been given in Jesus Christ our Lord? I see evidence of that reconciliation in quite a number of things among us. For example, at the window, as we share food with those who are hungry. In the local prison, as we help persons prepare to live a new life upon release. With goldenrod, as we live with persons who have particular issues in life. In the Jubilee Fund, as we share our resources to help families who face crises in their own experience with Habitat for Humanity, as we share resources to help someone finally have a home of their own. All these are good, and they, they give witness to the reconciliation that we have. But there are times when I, and I'm going to dare to think you also, need someone who will listen to me without judging, who will hold my hand and walk with me in those days when I feel overwhelmed and my own strength and patience runs out and I don't quite know what to do. Can we learn together ways of experiencing the presence of God's reconciling, healing love with each other? But can we also learn how we can ask each other for help? without feeling that we are weak and poor and bad? Can we accept the presence of God in each other and draw on that presence to find strength when it just isn't there for us personally? You see, <clears throat> on those days, and there are those days for all of us, when God seems just a bit far away and detached, your presence can bring healing and hope, and I can live off your strength when mine is just not very good for the day. You see, we don't have to be absolutely sure about how we define God in order to experience God's love because it's there in the midst of this community. It's been my experience that it's in the process of being involved with that I learn about. When we look at the prodigal son story that was read this morning, and here I'm taking a really big, deep, long breath. 
We like to think that we are the loving Father sitting there hoping that the Son will come back. As I lived with this story for the last couple of weeks, I'd like to suggest this morning that the Mennonite church is more the prodigal son than we are the loving father. We have taken our rich Anabaptist biblical heritage of peace and community and the presence of the kingdom right here, right now, and we have moved into a foreign theological land where we're feeding on the dry husks of American fundamentalism. While living in this strange land with its long robes and yardsticks that are very active, we have forgotten that the heart of the gospel is the Jesus teaching to love one another, to love each other and even our enemies. We need to share that in a nation right now that is really losing its way. Now, I'm not worried <clears throat> about those who were in Kansas City, but I find myself deeply saddened by those who have decided that correct doctrinal theological belief is a better sign of God's presence than the act of loving and caring and walking together in peace and joy and happiness. We have lost contact with that New Testament church at Antioch about which they said, behold, how those people love each other. Go back to the book of Acts and see who was present at that Antioch congregation. It was a crazy bunch of people with a wide diversity of thinking, history, and experience. It shouldn't be a surprise that we are experiencing division and spiritual hostility with our own familial family members. This strange theological land that we have been spending our heritage in has reshaped our identity so that we don't sense any need even to come back home again to a loving God who every day is sitting on the front porch hoping his son will come home. The prodigal son did come home, hoping to survive by getting some of the leftovers from the table of his father's servants, only to be greeted by a dad who threw a feast in his honor. The Jesus message of the good news of God's love is still valid. The waiting father is still there, looking down the path, hoping his son will come home. The door is still open to a loving God who is reaching out in the midst of us to love us and to help us to love each other, praying that we will be reconciled with God and with everyone with whom we share this world. Once again, maybe the really important message question for us is not, what do we have to do to be reconciled with God? But rather, do other people experience this reconciling love of God in us? Please, dear God, may it be so. Amen. One of the ways that we can respond to this amazing, welcoming, loving God who loves us through all of our failures is to offer ourselves back as imperfect as they are. That's the perfect, imperfect response. So let us now, in our time of offering, um, bring our offerings forward, or you can uh, place them in the baskets that helpers will provide. This is also the first Sunday of the month, so if you have a, an August birthday and 
you would like to receive a blessing from the pastoral team and uh, offer a birthday offering, you can do that into that basket. I'm also inviting us to stand, if you're comfortable doing so, to sing in Sing the Journey, number 44, The Love of God. It may feel like a little much. If you want to stay seated during this time, that's fine. But there's some energy in this song, and so you're invited to stand if you would like to. As agents of God's reconciling work, we offer our financial resources and we offer ourselves. I invite you to join me in reading the words of intention and promise found in your bulletin and also on the screens. And again, I invite you to read in your preferred language. As Christians united with Christ, we are called to participate in God's reconciling work in our world. Como siervos de la paz de Dios, nos obedecemos. Speak God's forgiveness, mercy, justice, and grace. Lead with God's strong yet tender compassion and reflect God's love and kindness. Sunday school is a little bit different for the month of August. And so please, if you are grades 12 and younger, disregard for this month what is printed in the bulletin about where you are supposed to go for Sunday school. Instead, today, if you are um, three and younger, you may go to the infant room or the toddler room. If you are um, four or going into kindergarten, um, you may go to um, the classroom that's labeled for you in the hallway back there. It's um, two doors down from the toddler room. And if you are going into first grade through going into sixth grade, um, then you may meet me in the circle and I'm going to help you go down to the Genesis room where you, where you will be starting Sunday school today. Parents may pick them up in the regular children's classrooms and 
If you go to the wrong one, it's okay. You'll get pointed to the right one to pick them up. And if you are in um, going into seventh grade through twelfth grade, I think you know what to do with Daniel. So that is the plan for today and for the Sundays that will follow this month. Thank you. We now close our time of worship <clears throat> with the blessing and sending song to Mamina. It's number 434 in the hymnal. And after the singing of that song, uh, you're invited to stay and listen to the drum circle for a few minutes, or you can move out into the surrounding areas um, for fellowship and conversation. Thank you.